Our discussion about the Declaration of Independence is going to begin with something that sounds really, really boring. But in fact, the British tax acts that Great Britain imposed upon the colonies between 1764 and 1783 are not only essential in understanding the path to independence, but were also quite scandalous at the time, and therefore maybe not so boring after all. The British provided significant support to the colonies during the French and Indian War. In fact, King George III thought this support so significant that as soon as the war was over, he began to tax the colonies for imported goods that the colonies couldn't otherwise produce themselves. It all started with the Sugar Act in 1764, which didn't just create a tax on sugar, but all imported goods that the colonists bought. Now you have to remember these people are being taxed by a government in which they have no representation at the time. So they were, the colonists were upset that they had to pay tax to a king um, who oversaw a government where they weren't even represented. They didn't even have a say. There were a lot of products that the colonists just couldn't make or grow themselves at the time. A lot of these products were things like sugar, molasses, paper, glass, lead, paint, tea. All of these imported products that the colonists bought now had a new tax on them. By the time 1773 rolled around, the colonists had been taxed off and on for different products. And, you know, a new, a new tax would come along and then, and then it would be repealed. But the one tax that was never repealed since 1764 was tea, the tax on tea. So in 1773, the colonists had been paying tax on tea for almost 10 years. And I cannot emphasize enough how important tea was at the time. I mean, these were former British people. This is a staple to their, not only their diet, but their lifestyle. It really didn't matter if you were rich or poor, young or old, everybody drank tea. Prior to the Tea Act of 1773, the British East India Company would sell its tea to colonial tea merchants who would in turn take the tea back with them to the colonies and sell it to merchants there. Well, the Tax Act allowed the British East India Company to skip the colonial merchants in the middle altogether and sell their tea directly to the colonies at a cheaper price. Rather than just accept an act of parliament that was passed without any representatives to vote on behalf of the 13 colonies, Many colonists boycotted British tea altogether in favor of tea that was either smuggled in by the Dutch or grown elsewhere. Meanwhile, the very well-connected British East India Company had a surplus of millions of pounds of tea just sitting there in storage, rotting away. So to avoid going out of business, they sent ships full of tea to Boston Harbor, where the British government had appointed Thomas Gage as the royal governor of Massachusetts in an attempt to force colonial merchants to buy the tea. It didn't work. Instead, in protest against the British, a group called the Sons of Liberty got together in the Boston Harbor in December 1773, boarded a ship loaded with tea, and dumped 342 chests of the stuff into the harbor. This act of defiance became known throughout the colonies as the Boston Tea Party, an event that would serve as a symbol of the widely held colonial proclamation, no taxation without representation. British backlash came in the form of the Intolerable Acts of 1774, known in Britain as the Coercive Acts. They were five acts passed by British Parliament that triggered the Revolutionary War and eventually independence from Britain. The acts created martial law throughout Massachusetts 
and closed the port in Boston until the colonists paid for the damages incurred by the Boston Tea Party. It also mandated the quartering of British soldiers by colonial households. Anytime a British soldier wanted to enter a colonial household and hang out or shack up, they could do so without permission by the homeowner. Imagine the terror that this produced. Martial law was imposed on Massachusetts. While the colonies had always been under British rule officially, in practice, they had ruled themselves for over a century. In the case of Massachusetts, it had been making its own laws and governing itself for over 150 years. And then, just like that, they were under martial law. Just a few months later, the First Continental Congress convened in September 1774. It was attended by 12 of the 13 colonies. Georgia, the youngest colony, wouldn't attend until the following year. The attendees really were not interested in talking about independence at the time. They were more concerned with petitioning King George III to hear their grievances and to expand further upon existing boycotts of all things British. They did this in a written declaration known as the Suffolk Resolves. There were a few delegates who still felt a glimmer of loyalty toward the British Empire. So when drafting the declaration, these loyalists made an effort to temper the language of the more rebellious patriots in the group. This didn't matter. An enraged third considered the Suffolk resolves to be a blatant act of rebellion. In retaliation, the American Prohibitory Act was passed by Parliament in response to the petition. The act was basically a tit-for-tat response that countered the colonies' boycotts of British goods with similar boycotts of American goods. Before long, an increasing number of British soldiers appeared throughout the colonies, followed by outbreaks of conflict beginning with the Battle of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775. The independence of the colonies had yet to be officially declared, yet the Revolutionary War was on. The Battle of Lexington and Concord was fought only a month prior to the Second Continental Congress, so it was still fresh in the minds of the delegates when they met. And the next battle was only days away. That June, the following month, in 1775, following the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Continental Army was officially authorized, with George Washington as its commander-in-chief. By January 1776, the Intolerable Acts and the Revolutionary War prompted chatter among the colonists about independence. On January 10th, a new book about egalitarian government, written by an anonymous author, at the time anyway, appeared in colonial bookstores. The book was titled Common Sense, and it was an instant hit. Its author, who we now know was Thomas Paine, wrote in a clear and persuasive language aimed toward common, average colonists who made up the majority of the population. Here is an excerpt. A government of our own is our natural right. And when a man seriously reflects on the precariousness of human affairs, he will become convinced that it is infinitely wiser and safer to form a constitution of our own in a cool and deliberate manner while we have it in our power than to trust such an interesting event to time and chance. Nothing can settle our affairs so expeditiously as an open and determined declaration for independence. These ideas were not new. They were the topic of many a tavern debate and had been that way for quite a few years throughout the colonies. It was just that pain had a way of saying these things that was new and most importantly, Payne's words were motivating. 
The arguments contained in common sense were just that, common sense about common problems experienced by common people who had never been afforded the opportunity to make choices about the type of government that ruled them. Yet they were the first to volunteer their sons and their guns to the war effort. In fact, colonies didn't have any money to pay soldiers fighting the war being fought at the time. Instead, soldiers grabbed their own firearms, if they owned them, and took to the field. They ponied up their own resources to fight against the British. And for what? For years, soldiers were paid little more than IOUs. Before long, they were losing everything they had, everything they had worked for. Banks were foreclosing on their property because they wouldn't honor the IOUs as money. Payne's arguments were logical, and they struck the hearts and minds of the patriots, sacrificing life and their own property, something they were willing to do if they could just have some role in whatever government that was going to rule them. But before a new government could be officially formed, independence from Britain must be officially declared. And you could bet that writings by people like Payne and John Locke would have an influence on that Declaration of Independence. And boy, did it ever. After the Second Continental Congress first convened in the spring of 1775, Talk of independence was a primary topic of discussion throughout the colonies. By the summer of 1776, Congress had already suggested that each colony establish their own state government that had no connection to Britain. Some wrote their own constitutions and others simply readopted the language of their British royal charters as state constitutions. The delegates of the states to the Continental Congress reconvened in June 1776 to discuss officially declaring independence. They still had the challenge of convincing the states that they represented to allow them to vote for it, though. In order to do that, they needed to draft such a document so they had something to show the states. So on June 11th, the Continental Congress appointed Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, John Adams of Massachusetts, Robert R. Livingston of New York, and Roger Sherman of Connecticut to a committee of five to draft a declaration. However, the majority of the writing was done in just 17 days by Thomas Jefferson under the committee's advisement. Richard Henry Lee, delegate of Virginia, proposed first voting on a brief Resolution of Independence, also known as the Lee Resolution. On July 2nd, the Resolution of Independence was passed by the Second Continental Congress. It stated, Resolved that these united colonies are, and of right to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved, that it is expedient forthwith to take the most effectual measures for forming foreign alliances, that a plan of confederation be prepared and transmitted to the respective colonies for their consideration and approbation. John Adams wrote in a letter to his wife Abigail, the second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival, with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. Two days later, on July 4, 1776, the final draft of the unanimous Declaration of Independence was adopted by the 13 colonies. The best way to understand this brief document is simply to read it for yourself. But, since I have your attention, why not read it together now? It's really quite good. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary 
for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whatever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the same establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions from within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropri appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior 
to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troop among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred and to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguity. We must therefore acquiesce to the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, 
and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And that's it. Not bad, huh? So the statement that all men are created equal and have inherent natural rights that include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was pretty revolutionary at the time. It was inspired by the writings of English philosopher John Locke, whose writing was well known and further reinforced among the colonists by the overwhelming popularity of Thomas Paine's book, Common Sense, published just six months prior. The concepts of equality, natural rights, and a government established through a social contract with the people became defining and fundamental ideals of the American national identity. But more important at the time was the new legitimacy that the official declaration provided to the colonies in the eyes of foreign governments from whom the colonies sought badly needed military aid. This ensured other governments that the colonies were now a completely separate entity from Britain. Otherwise, they wouldn't provide aids, aid or loans to the colonies. Fortunately, um, we did declare independence and fortunately that aid was provided. Had this not been the case, the Revolutionary War, a war that was fought between 13 fragile colonies who had just claimed independence, and the world's greatest empire. You think about that matchup there. Had we not received the aid that we received, it would have been really difficult to win the Revolutionary War. On July 4th, 1776, the 13 British colonies had formally declared themselves to be the 13 United States of America, independent from the British crown. But formalities aside, that independence wasn't complete until the Revolutionary War was won five years later. First in practice, with the surrender of Britain's General Cornwallis at Yorktown in 1781, Second, in writing, with the Treaty of Paris, in which Britain formally recognized the independence of the United States. During these years, the new nation was busy building a novel form of government, a process that was not without its challenges. Some wanted a strong central government, and others wanted the states to retain their sovereignty, fearing the threat that too much national power over them was going to make them end up in a situation that they had just recently fought dearly to escape. A month before the Declaration of Independence was even adopted, the Continental Congress began drafting the Articles of Confederation, which established a weak central government. A confederation is a voluntary association of independent states who agree to sacrifice some of their liberty to allow for cooperation as a unified group while maintaining their sovereignty. The thing about confederations, though, is that they only work when everyone agrees to cooperate. Without significant motivation to do so, Sovereign states and those who lead them rarely find such motivation unless there is significant punishment or reward involved. As James Madison said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. On November 15, 1777, the Articles of Confederation were finished. Most colonies began immediately conducting their affairs according to the Articles, even though they weren't yet ratified by the last state, Maryland, until March 1, 1781. Under the Articles, the government of the states was called the Congress of the Confederation, 
it was a unicameral legislature with ambassadors from each state. Each state had one vote in Congress, and each year they selected a member to serve as the president of the Congress of the Confederation, who wasn't anything close to being a president of the United States. Rather, he functioned as the presiding officer over the Congress. I guess you could compare the president of Congress to the Speaker of the House of Representatives or the leader of the Senate, only as a unicameral legislature, only one presiding officer was necessary. An executive committee was to be appointed to oversee the business of Congress during recess. Congress had the ability to create officers and committees as necessary, but could not establish coinage. Now, this was the big problem. It could establish and maintain an army, but it couldn't tax the states in order to fund it. If any revenue for the Confederation was to be collected, Congress had to ask the states who, in turn, would have to volunteer to give it. In other words, under the Articles, Congress had very few powers, and the very few powers they had, they couldn't pay for. One other weakness of the Articles of Confederation that doesn't seem to get as much attention is that they provided for no national court system. This is consistent with the state's apprehension to relinquish sovereignty to any outside central governing or decision-making body. The Articles required nine out of 13 states to act on anything, and amendments required unanimous consent. Obviously, these are high bars for getting anything done. On the bright side, the Articles settled several states' claims to Western lands and provided for the passage of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, establishing a blueprint for any new territories north of the Ohio River. But the new states were broke. So broke that George Washington had to disband the army as soon as the Revolutionary War was over. And by 1784, the new nation was not only broke, it was in an economic depression. During the war, the colonies paid soldiers and creditors with promissory notes, IOUs, and various types of paper currency that had absolutely no value. Banks were refusing to lend money, and they even began calling in active loans and repossessing homes and farms and businesses throughout the states. In response to this, in August of 1786, Daniel Shays led an armed mob of fellow farmers to the Springfield, Massachusetts courthouse to give their debtors a rude awakening. They were held off, but barely, by the federal arsenal in Springfield. The nation's leaders got the message and they called for a convention to be held in Philadelphia in May 1787. What many thought would be an economic discussion would become a constitutional convention. Upon hearing the news of Shays' Rebellion in August of 1786, the nation's leaders knew that something had to change. So an urgent meeting of the states was called by Virginia. Now the speed of travel over land was limited, quite literally, to horsepower in 1786. So to ask for a meeting of all of the states to be held in less than a month was almost like asking for the impossible. So instead, 12 representatives from five states, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia met from September 11th through the 14th, 1786, in Annapolis, Maryland, less than a month after the rebellion. Its official title at the time was A Meeting of Commissioners to Remedy Defects of the Federal Government. 
but today we refer to it as the Annapolis Convention. The direct issue at hand in Annapolis was financial, but once the meeting began, it was clear that their collective financial problems were largely due to the shortcomings of the Articles of Confederation. If their union was to survive, they would need to hold a serious convention that all of the states could attend. So they asked Congress, and Congress approved, to hold a general convention of the states the following May of 1787 in Philadelphia. When I refer to the Constitutional Convention as a serious convention, I mean it. It lasted 115 days. Imagine going to a work convention that lasts 115 days during the summer months in Philadelphia, which isn't as hot as some places get, but still, the delegates wanted to keep the proceedings confidential, so they holed up in the East Room of the Philadelphia State House with all the doors and windows shut. The East Room is not a particularly large space for 55 men wearing wigs and dressed in suits and stockings that were mostly made out of wool and silk, making things um, unpleasant for the delegates. Luckily, there was a tavern next door called the Indian Queen, which became the unofficial convention headquarters throughout the summer. In fact, five of the delegates stayed in the boarding house at the tavern. When it comes to alcoholic refreshments, the Founding Fathers were known to imbibe, and we'll talk more about this later. Twelve states were represented at the Constitutional Convention. The 13th state, Rhode Island, refused to send any delegates. 74 delegates were chosen, but only 55 attended, and out of those, only 40 of them were major participants. Half of them were college graduates, and most of them had wealth that was within the top 5% of the population. 33 were lawyers, 8 were prominent businessmen, there were 7 former chief executives of their home states, and 6 of the delegates owned large plantations. They were a pretty young group, by today's standards anyway. James Madison was 36. Alexander Hamilton was 32, and the youngest, Jonathan Dayton from Ohio, was only 26 years old. But not everyone was so young. The senior statesman of the group was the delegate from Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin, at age 81. He was suffering from severe gout at the time and was unable to walk for most of the convention. So, the delegates got four inmates from the local jail to carry him around on a chair. But if you leave him out, the average age of the delegates was 42. Recall that the states had recently been through the process of adopting their own constitutions. Some of these states simply did a lot of copy and paste work with the language of their old royal charters. Others completely redesigned their state governments and their new constitutions. Several of these states adopted elements of government design that not many had heard of before. A closer look at these new design elements gives us an idea of what would be proposed at the Philadelphia Convention. For example, in 1780, Massachusetts wrote a new constitution that replaced its unicameral legislature with a bicameral legislature that had two separate chambers with power to check and balance one another. In 1784, New Hampshire's new constitution created an independent judiciary in which judges were appointed to lifetime service by an executive. And Thomas Jefferson had proposed to Virginia a constitutional plan that contained a Senate with veto power and lifetime appointments to an independent judiciary. So while the U.S. Constitution created a completely new form of government, different from any other in the world at the time, many of its elements were already in development in the states. 
To this day, we see many U.S. state and local governments acting as test models for policies that are later adopted by other state governments or even at the federal level. The ability for a single country to contain a diverse assortment of state and local government designs is a benefit of a federal system of government. In order to understand the Convention's main factions and their respective plans, we need to know how the states stack up to one another by population size. These bubbles represent the comparative population sizes of the states in 1787, and that little tiny black dot there is Georgia. For much of the conference, the two main plans under consideration were the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan. The Virginia Plan was primarily favored by the larger states. It proposed a bicameral legislature with a lower chamber chosen by the people, the House of Representatives, and an upper chamber chosen by the lower chamber from nominees selected by state legislatures. The upper chamber would be the Senate. The number of representatives would be proportional to a state's population. So you can see why the states with larger populations like Virginia would favor this plan over the smaller population states. Also, the legislature could void any state laws. The Virginia plan called for an unspecified national executive elected by the legislature and a national judiciary appointed by the legislature. The New Jersey plan maintained the fundamental principles of the Articles of Confederation, one state, one vote. It proposed that Congress would be able to regulate trade and impose taxes. And it added that all acts of the national legislature would be the supreme law of the land. And instead of just one executive, several people would be elected by Congress to form an executive office. And finally, the executive would appoint members to a Supreme Court. While the New Jersey plan had some significant support, the debate between these two main factions went on for weeks. The New Jersey plan was rejected by the majority of the delegates, but the smaller states who supported the plan threatened to leave if the Virginia plan remained on the table. And then Roger Sherman of Connecticut proposed a compromise. Taking key concepts from the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan, Robert Sherman's Connecticut Compromise was something that the delegates could live with. The Connecticut Compromise proposed a bicameral legislature with the lower chamber apportioned according to the number of free inhabitants in each state, plus three-fifths of all slaves and an upper chamber with two members from each state, regardless of population, elected by the state legislatures. But the Connecticut Compromise only solved the disagreement regarding representation and population size. It gave the southern states who relied on slaves for free labor extra representation for slaves that were never truly represented in government by anyone. The southern states also won a guarantee that the slave trade could continue for the next 20 years, along with a law that demanded northern states return fugitive slaves to their southern owners. Historians say that many delegates like George Washington and James Madison objected to slavery. Both, however, were themselves slave owners. On the compromise of slavery, Madison wrote, Quote, great as the evil is, a dismemberment of the Union would be even worse, unquote. But less than 100 years later, 
what began as a compromise to prevent the dismemberment of the Union would cause a civil war that temporarily did just that. It was already several weeks into the convention and the delegates still needed to decide what the structure of the new central government would look like. Many disagreements and debates were had. The South worried that the northern states would have a majority in the legislature and would tax them on their agricultural exports. The North agreed that they wouldn't tax the South's exports. In exchange, the South agreed that Congress could regulate commerce among the states. Important structural questions remained. Would there be an executive and what would they call him? Or instead of a single executive, should there be an executive committee? And if so, who would choose the committee members? And what about a national court system? But the big question looming overhead was about sovereignty. Would the state or the national government be the supreme law of the land? So the delegates asked trusted James Madison to draft a proposal that would pull it all together. James Madison, a well-respected delegate of Virginia, had been preparing for just such a request. A well-educated man who was already quite knowledgeable on the topic to begin with, Madison had been diligently studying European political theory for months before the convention. Madison's whole life was a 36-year dress rehearsal for this very occasion. In fact, we know as much as we do about the day-to-day -day details of the convention because James Madison kept a meticulous diary throughout the proceedings. By the end of the convention, Madison had drafted a model of government that was presented to the delegates of the states. It is that same Madisonian model that serves as the foundation of the United States Constitution to this day. The fundamental principles of the Madisonian model are the same as those of the Constitution. They are control by the people, otherwise known as popular sovereignty, limited government with written laws, a republic in which people choose representatives who make decisions for everyone, separation of powers of three branches of government with checks and balances over one another, all to prevent one branch from becoming too powerful, and a federal system of shared powers between each state government and one national government. On the issue of sovereignty, Madison proposed a federal system in which the national government has ultimate sovereignty, but the states reserve the right to govern themselves where the federal government does not. This concept was considered to be a type of dual sovereignty in fact, the majority of day-to-day -day governing would be done by the states. There would be three co-equal branches of government with a system of checks and balances to ensure that no one branch could have too much power. And there would be limitations on the federal government itself, so it would never have too much power over the states. This was truly innovative. There would be a bicameral legislative branch that makes the laws with two chambers, an upper chamber or Senate, with two senators from each state regardless of population. The senators would be chosen by the lower chamber, that is, until the passage of the 17th Amendment, which made senators elected officials who serve in six-year terms. The lower chamber would be a House of Representatives, in which representatives would be allocated based on the population structure from the Connecticut Compromise. Representatives would be popularly elected by their districts in their states. Within the legislative branch, cooperation would be required to pass bills into law. So there's a little bit of a check and balance right there. And then if these bills do pass through both chambers, they are then sent to the nation's chief executive, the President of the United States, to be either signed or vetoed 
which brings us to the second co-equal branch of government, the executive branch, which would be in charge of carrying out the law. At its head would be an elected president of the United States. The president would be the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and sign bills into law, among other things. He would be chosen by an electoral college whose electors are chosen through elections held by each state. The number of electors for each state would be equal to the sum of a state's senators and representatives combined. Presidents would serve for four-year terms until eventually the 22nd Amendment would limit the president to two terms to four-year terms in office. And finally, the third co-equal branch would be an independent judicial branch to interpret the law, with the Supreme Court of Justices appointed for life by the President and confirmed by the Senate, and under which Congress would create lower courts. Each branch, in its own way, could check the other to ensure a balance of power. The Constitution, based on the Madisonian model of government, was approved by 39 of the 40 or so delegates that were still in Philadelphia at the end of the Constitutional Convention in September 1787. On the evening following the signing of the Constitution, George Washington took the delegates out for a well-deserved celebration and meal to honor the occasion. Years later, historians found an itemized bill for the evening in which 55 gentlemen ordered and consumed 54 bottles of Madeira wine, 60 bottles of claret, 22 bottles of port, 12 bottles of beer, 8 bottles of cider, and 7 large bowls of alcoholic punch. In all, over 45 gallons of alcohol were served to 55 gentlemen. Also, the nine musicians and seven waiters hired by the founders ran up their own liquor bill, which consisted of 21 additional bottles of wine that the delegates were good enough to pay for. The bill included a line item for cigars and candles and another for the broken wine glasses, decanters, and tumblers. But it wasn't a done deal yet. This new constitution still needed to be ratified by nine out of the 13 states. So a campaign toward ratification began immediately. The two opposing sides in the constitutional debate were the Federalists, who were in favor of the constitution, versus the Anti-Federalists, who were not. Each state would hold their own constitutional convention to discuss and debate whether to ratify the Constitution or not. The Federalists and Anti-Federalists alike would campaign for their side and defend it all the way to their state convention, where the decision-making process would begin. Now, for some states, ratification was an easier decision than others. It wasn't until 1788 that the ninth state, New Hampshire, signed the Constitution. And the final state to ratify the Constitution, Rhode Island, did not even do so until 1790. So you can see that ratification didn't happen overnight, but it did happen. 